thanks, Claire. Thanks, everyone, for listening in to Back Porch Bluegrass. Tune in again next week, and we'll have another new program for you. Uh, if you'd been at the festival with the Trendworths on uh, the weekend, you would have heard us play old Joe Clark, and we get everyone up and dancing away to this. Uh, here's the grass girls doing it. Tune in again next week. Bye. <laughs> Episodes, use the accessmedia.nz app for iOS and Android devices or subscribe to this. Hello there and welcome. We are live from Bandwidth Studios. I am one of your hosts, Charlie. Uh, I'm Bastion here again. Oh, and I'm so excited to have Bastion back in studio. It was a very sad announcement we made recently. Uh, Bastion has left Bandwidth, but for better causes. You know, doing things like equipment team directing, working on some uh, video game music homework, um, <laughs> among other things. I don't want to. Uh, I don't want to give anything away about the show tonight. But yes, we have a very special show, and I'll, and I'll introduce it in a second. But before we do, I just want to say a couple of introductory things like we always do on bandwidth. So first of all, you always have to start off the show by saying uh, thank you, Lee Gregory. I don't know where we'd be without you. Shout out Lee Gregory. Uh, you make our show possible, and, and we really appreciate that. Uh, shout out to the listening party, all, all those there. I hope it's more than Zach and Amelia tonight. Priscilla, you better be back uh, tonight. I hope to hope you're listening. Uh, and hopefully we have some new listening party members. That would be, uh, it's a really great community and I always love spending some time there. And I'll see you guys at 8.30 most likely. Um, so to get into some more Jam Networky announcements, um, what are you doing this Valentine's Day? You guys doing anything this Valentine's Day? I'm doing a couple special things. Are you, are you, uh, are you playing some music for anyone? I, I, might, I might be doing some serenading. Alex, are you doing anything this Valentine's Day? I'm hoping to uh, send some people to serenade some friends of mine for a Valentine's Day. So. Well, uh, everyone here is hinting at the fact that Jam Network is um, going for another round of Jam Grams this, this Valentine's Day. What is a Jam Gram? Essentially, uh, for the low price of $10, we will show up anywhere on campus and serenade uh, your love, maybe your enemy, maybe a close friend, maybe a family member, maybe anyone in your life is special enough to give a jam gram to. Uh, you give us a time, you give us a place, and we will, you know, play uh, a love song for them. So uh, if you want to buy a jam gram, uh, email us, DM us, and uh, we can get you in contact. Um, uh, the form is not out yet, but it will be out very soon. Uh, another announcement is that, of course, we have our album concert coming up on the 29th. And the album has been chosen. Bastion, did you hear what album we uh, we I chose? I don't want to announce it. <laughs> well, it's a it's a little known uh, disc uh, made in 1977. You might have heard of it. It's called Rumors by Fleetwood Mac. And yes, I'm being sarcastic. It was a top 
selling album in the 70s. And so uh, we're performing at the Princess Cinema, uh, 7 p.m. on Thursday, February 29th. It's going to be very exciting. Uh, Psyops will go up tomorrow at 9 o'clock. Uh, if you want to play a song, you can find it in our Instagram bio. It's also been emailed out to you uh, through the newsletter. And uh, yeah, just generally talk to us. And then we're going to be charging for tickets at this event. So if you want to buy a ticket, they'll be $5 and they'll be up pretty soon in the next week or so, hopefully. Um, and lastly, before we get into it, um, I just wanted to say that Jamboree season never stops. Uh, Jamboree is our... You know, it's, it's a very dear event in all of our hearts, and uh, we all really love and care for the Jamboree. And if you want to play at this year's uh, event, then you should start preparing now because auditions will take place in about a month's time. So uh, get ready for that, and uh, it's never too early to start Jamboreeing, if you know what I mean. Any comments on Jamboree, you guys? No, I don't want to think about that yet. <laughs> okay, uh, well... Before we get into the show topic, I, I might just ask you, Bastian, um, have you played any video games recently? Okay, like, like at first glance, I, I, I want to say no because I've just been really busy, but that's actually not true. Like, like since uh, I, I, like I downloaded, a, like I have a Game Boy Advance emulator on my phone, so I actually I wanted, wanted to like play Final Fantasy IV for the first time, so I got four, and then also... I took a look at my one Pokemon run for a few minutes because I, I, I opened up the app again and after a really long time and got a little distracted. So you have played some form of, of video games in the last month or so. On bus rides. Uh, so obviously, like, the technical elements of video games are, are very clear and, like, the, the game structure is clear when you're playing. But do you ever notice other elements, maybe, maybe like, audio elements to the video game? Well, yeah, I think that's, like, one of the most important parts. I would agree, which is why uh, we brought in uh, someone very uh, s special in that regard. Um, I, want to, I want to announce um, that we've brought in uh, Dr. Marina Gallagher to talk about the idea of video game music. Welcome. Welcome, Professor. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm so glad you're here. And um, I first sort of heard about you because you know, vi video games are pretty big in our club. Uh, beyond music, they're pretty big. We even have like a gaming sort of channel on our Discord. Oh but there, there was talks in that, in that about certain musical elements to video games because obviously like music fans that are also gamers are going to be naturally interested in this. Okay. And so um, actually, I think it was December or maybe it was the beginning of January when that it was mentioned to me that there's actually a class starting in winter 2024 on video game music, and my mind has exploded because that's really darn cool. Thank you. Uh, and so I was, wa I was wondering, just to start, I was wondering if you could introduce yourself, uh, your background and, uh, and interests, and also the, the class you're teaching right now. Definitely, yeah. Um, so yeah, I'm Marina Gallagher. Um, I'm actually an alumna of the University of Waterloo as well. I graduated in 2015 with a Bachelor of Arts in Music and Classical Studies. Um, and then, thank you. I ended up going on to UBC to do my PhD in musicology, um, but I ended up studying video game music. Um, I'm a big gamer myself. I started playing like RPGs, like Kingdom Hearts and Final Fantasy um, when I was like 10 years old. And so when it was time to choose a thesis topic, it seemed very natural to do something that was video game music related. Um, so my thesis was actually on music and landscapes in Final Fantasy X, 12, 13, and 15 kind of looking at how the music impacts how you feel about different types of areas and tracing the visual features of those areas back to like ancient poetry on the classic side of things. So, yeah. So that was your undergraduate thesis? Uh, that was my PhD. Oh, yeah. that was your PhD, okay. I, I did a little bit. Um, I did some like um, special topics courses as an undergrad with Dr. Laura Gray, um, where we looked at music and landscapes in Final Fantasy XII. Uh, yeah, so that was kind of the springboard for my dissertation. Um, and originally. I, I just want to say quickly, I, I love Laura Gray. She's I know, an she's a, a, amazing. amazing professor. Uh, well, I will ask you then, when you were at Grable in your undergrad, um, did you have this ambition to one day become an expert in video game music and to one day become a professor in it? Hmm. 
was that a was that a thought in your in your mind at that time not so much no i i don't suppose so i also had like an entrepreneurial side so i was thinking more of doing like you know starting my own business as i was finishing my undergrad you know some people suggested that i should go on and do grad work um so then doing that special study with dr gray i was like well why don't i go and study like video game music it was originally going to be more video game music and opera um kind of the the kind of original kind of features of game music we can see some ties back to opera and that kind of morphed into being more landscapes and kind of focusing that way so but yeah right because I, I also learned that you're classically trained uh, as well yeah. um, so you have that you have that dual interest in both like the classics and also in video game music which I find to be interesting because th there are definitely some video game tracks that are heavily inspired by you know classical works that I've mm -hmm. I've noticed at least in some way Definitely. Um, yeah, well, we were talking in class a few weeks ago about some Castlevania, Symphony of the Night, um, and Michiru Yamane is very inspired by Johann Sebastian Bach, and so you can see, like, a lot of um, inspiration from, like, Bach's Toccata, Toccata and Fugue, like the famous Halloween-inspired one that gives that gothic kind of sense to one of the castles in the game, so wow. definitely. Could you just say the name of that track again? Because I want to post all this information in the chat so everyone yeah. can know. Like, just the name of the track that you said. It's Finale Toccata. Yeah, it's really cool. So we actually compared like both pieces in class as well. <laughs> Wait, T -O -T -A -double -T -A. <laughs> okay. Like Tokata. You know what? I think I think they'll find it. Fine. It's, really it's, but, all good. it's all good. Yeah. I really wish we could play a quick snippet of it. Oh, it's so Because it's it's so iconic, but yeah. I, if we have time at the end we can we can play yeah, it. Right. It sounds awesome. iconic. Awesome. Um, so yeah. So then okay, so you graduated with your undergrad in at Grable mm -hmm. and then you went on to UBC, I believe. Is mm -hmm. that correct? Oh. Yeah, for my PhD. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Did they have a developed like video game music, d not department, but area? No, no, no they it didn't. Was, so cool. It was something I kind of had to fight for in my first year. Um, this originally like my advisor, um, Dr. David Metzer is really great. He studies like ballads and pop songs and rap music. And I think he's recently gotten into like K-pop as well. Um, so he's very modern in terms of what he studies, but not so much game music. Um, so it was one of those things in first year, they kind of took me aside and they're like, oh, are you sure you want to study video game music? You know, do you want to do something more traditional? I'm like, no, I, I want to keep doing game music. So now I think things have grown so much in the field of like ludomusicology or video game music studies that it's becoming much more common and much more acceptable to do it. But at the time it was still like very new and they weren't really sure like if it was viable, right? So things have changed a lot in the last like eight years. And this is 2018, 2019 or? Uh, I started in like 2015. Right, so yeah. even, in, yeah, even in the last eight, eight mm -hmm. or so years, it's changed that much. Oh, for sure, yeah. Well, like um, Ludo Musicology, the conference, I've been plugging it in my class as well, the North American Conference on Video Games. I wanna music. ask you about that, yeah. Yeah, it's only in its 11th year this year. So like it's, mm -hmm. st it's still very recent and game music as a field kind of came online the early 2000s. So it's still very, very new. But yeah, it's still piecemeal in terms of research that's out there. Wow, okay, well, throughout the next um, you know, half hour or so, I wanna get into your specific interests. Um, so um, first of all, I, I wanna go into the history of video game music, mm -hmm. just so that I think, so some of our audience can understand more uh, how we got to where we are today, because you're talking about how now it's emerged as an actual field of study, so I think, right. Talking about its history would be good. And we have a video game music aficionado beside me here that wants to ask a bunch of questions. <laughs> yeah. So uh, exactly. take it away, Bastion. Yeah, I just, I, I just kind of thought it would be a good idea since I was like in the class and also interested if I could kind of like, like just like kind of put the talking points down and then just let you d do oh, the whole sure. thing. But just, just walk it up all the way from like arcades through the different generations of 8-bit. Just give, give the quick brief thing, brief thing that we kind of did for the past few weeks. But yeah, for sure. From the start, I want to hear, like, the, the, I wanna hear like, the origins. Like the I want to hear, yeah. I wanna hear <laughs> origins. So please, whatever you, wanna, whatever you want to say. Yeah, yeah, for sure. But yeah, so yeah, it's been the first, like the first four weeks of our class has been history and now we're getting to like other topics of game music. But yeah, it's one of those things, the earliest uh, video games, if they can sort of be called that, from like the late 1950s and the early 60s, were kind of simulations, like computer simulation games. So there was one called OXO, which is like essentially like um, chess against a computer, but it was tic-tac-toe. Um, so that was one of like the earliest video games, if we can call it that. 
Um, and in the 60s, there was also like the first official official one was called Tennis for Two, which was essentially like Pong, but no sound. So it was just like two kind of like paddles moving back and forth and a ball that you would bounce between them it was one of the like the first games. Um, but the earliest ones didn't have sound at all. So, so those like the, the tic-tac-toe and the pong, were, was, there any, was there any sound at that point? Pong or was it? there was in like the early 70s. There's like an iconic like bip, bip, oh, back and yes, forth. And I've then like a brr, and when you, like, <laughs> you miss. Um, but we talked about in class how they actually wanted to have like a cheering crowd and then like booze, depending on whether you got the point or you missed. But the sound chip was not capable of producing that. So they ended up just going with like the or whatever kind of sound. So they were very limited in what they could do. In my brief, you know, reading of the history of video game music, it has seemed I, I've I've come into this idea that you know, like the technology in the '70s or even the '80s was not capable of having multiple tracks. Yeah, and this is something definitely. I'm trying to understand because mixers existed, like multi-track mixers. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering why the technology was not at the point where like computer chips could not handle that right. so well, I guess I'm just yeah. curious about that and like the evolution technologically exactly in the 80s or 90s or something yeah but. well I mean the earliest games as well like think Space Invaders and things like that were on pr primarily like arcade machines right so they were limited by like each arcade machine had its own distinct sound chip and there were like limits to what they could do with that as well um, but even so like when it came to 8-bit like the consoles that we're using the different, um, like we're creating music, like the Nintendo Entertainment System. It still had limitations, like its sound chip only had like five channels and you could use only three of them at once because like that was the limitation of the hardware at the time. So composers had to get very creative with how they used those three channels simultaneously to give you a sense that the music was much more active than it actually was or a lot fuller. So, yeah, people were very, very creative. I think it was, like, just the early 2000s, really, like the PlayStation 1 and whatnot, when they finally were released from technological constraints and could kind of compose what they wanted with real instruments or with digital instruments. So, yeah, that's one of the things we kind of traced in class, too, is, like, 8-bit, you can only have three parts at once. 16-bit, you could expand that, and they actually sounded like real instruments for the first time. You had something that actually sounded like a flute instead of just like waves, sound waves, right? For mm -hmm. for audience members who might not be aware, like me, for example, uh, when 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 you say bit, what does that mean exactly? I'm not really sure of the terminology. Yeah, definitely. So that's kind of like the depth of kind of the sound as well. So yeah, so it's kind of like how how much capability the system had, as far as I know. I'm not like so technological side either, so I'm like, I don't know. It's kind of like the the capacity of the system from what I can recall. Did um, the system start at one bit in the 1950s? Like, was there a one bit <laughs> console and then a two bit? Or just eight bit, yeah, just oh, eight bit. Oh, okay, yeah. so it started at eight bit. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, the, and then the pre-arcade stuff, which we don't really talk about the bits at all in terms of, yeah, in terms of capabilities, just what it could do. So even like if it could do continuous looping music and things like that. So, which was a, a big thing, you know, to have like Space Invaders music speed up when you're getting to the end of the level was like huge for the time in like the late 70s. Wow. So, yeah, definitely. Yeah, I, I think it's a maybe a good time to like show an example of, oh. of one of the songs. Nice. So may, maybe Charlie, if you want to play uh, this one here. This is, from is, is this a contemporary example or no, one no, from this the... No, no, this is an 8-bit example. Nice. Uh, do we want to preface the, it in any way, or do we want to go right into it and then talk about I it? I want to go right into it for the, for the right. surprise, and then, and then you, yeah. Okay, do we want to say the title? <laughs> yeah, title right <laughs> All right, so this is the Zelda main theme song. Classic.
So that was a more modern example of uh, video game music. We actually want to take you right back to 1986 to show you some classic 8-bit music. This, this would be 8-bit. So here's the original uh, main theme song from Zelda. That's pretty cool. <laughs> wow. So there were there were three tracks or channels in that. There was a synth part of some kind, yeah, a bass, a bass yeah. and a, a noise channel, a drum mm -hmm. channel. So p please tell us like, you know, how that was made and the more of the details of that of that track cuz that's some early video game video game music. Exactly. Yeah. So that's an example of that 8-bit music. So like on the the sound chip for the Nintendo entertainment system which was like the console where a lot of the 8-bit music like what it was made for you had like those five channels that i was talking about so there were usually two like channels that produced square waves so those were usually created for a melody which you heard in the zelda then the triangle channel which is much more limited in terms of its range it has about an octave um, so that was the the bass line that was like do 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 underneath um, and here we also had the like you said the noise channel so it produced like white noise um, but it was usually used for percussion effects there was also like a sampler um, that was on that system a delta modulation uh, channel which would produce small like samples of sounds or like recorded voices but it was used sparingly because it took up so much space on like the console as well so yeah so that's very classic 8-bit i was gonna say it seems like space on the hard drive was a very um important restraint in those days absolutely a and that's yeah. that's really fascinating from a technological perspective definitely but, yeah so do you do you want to talk about the evolution of that technology and when we got to the point you said the early 2000s but mm -hmm. do you do you want to tell us more about that and how we got to a more modern place in video game music for sure, yeah. So yeah, it's, I mean, like you heard there, and you know, Bastion was talking about this too while we were listening, like the music, the composers like Koji Kondo, like for Zelda and Mario and Nobuo Uematsu for Final Fantasy and all these like classic game composers were working with that 8-bit music and they had these very creative ways of getting around the restrictions. So there's a lot of like rhythm activity and quick rhythms and stuff to give you that impression that a lot more is happening than there actually is. <laughs> Um, so they, they make you believe that you're listening to a much fuller sound than just three parts at once. Um, but that kind of changed even in like the follow-up to the Nintendo Entertainment System was the Super NES um, and also the Sega Genesis console, um, which was just like a couple years later. And already it was like 16 bits. So they had more evolved sound chips that allowed them to actually emulate real orchestral instruments. So you had things that sounded like an actual flute, a violin and whatnot. They could have like longer loops, like the Zelda loop is like 30 seconds, 45 seconds. It's very short, 
kind of joke with the listening portion for our midterm, like if I play something 8-bit, it's 30 seconds, you're going to hear like the whole thing um, because it's <laughs> that short. So they could produce these longer, more complex pieces of music um, that are like two minutes long, three minutes long, much more kind of like thick in terms of their texture and what's actually happening with the instruments. So that's still like, it's all digitally produced. Um, and same, like you can start to see things evolving, like the, the Super Nintendo had more orchestral sounding music, kind of like in the vein of the Zelda that we heard. But the Sega Genesis had more like prog rock characteristics because it had like different sound chips that made it harder to program. So people tended to use like the same sound files and stuff in different, different songs because it was already coded into the console. And it was hard to like create new sounds from scratch. So they had like a set number they liked to use. Things like that. Like, like I, I didn't know about the prog rock influence before the class, and that was like, yeah. so, was like so cool for me when I was like, oh, this guy listened to Pink Floyd. I'm like, of course, like that's I so know. funny. It's so awesome. Yeah, there were so many composers. Like we talked about mm. Hiroki Kikuta for like Secret of Mana. You know, he ended up partly getting the job at Square because he hit it off with Nobuo Uematsu in the interview about prog rock. They were like nerding out about prog rock, and partially Uematsu's like, yeah. I'd love to work with you, you know, like uh, you can have the job as composer. There are so many composers influenced by various forms of rock as well, especially prog rock. But yeah, definitely. It's a bit of a trend. I, I see. Like may maybe I'm hyper fixated on the technology, but I want to just yeah. cl clarify because you said that in the early 2000s, we could start mm -hmm. emulating the sounds of instruments such as violin and flute. Mm -hmm. um, so, did that, so that to me, that implies that it was still digitally produced, like this violin. Mm. It wasn't yeah. actually recorded. No, exactly. Um, and so I'm wondering, like, is even today in the industry, is, are things done mainly on MIDI still, or are there actual audio recordings right. now um, in it, video game music? It depends, yeah. I mean, okay. like, even this past week, we've been looking, we went all the way up to, like, the PlayStation 5, the Xbox Series X and S, and the Nintendo Switch. And really, like, what you see more is that it's not the technological constraints that drive what a score sounds like, but it's aesthetic considerations and budget. So, like, we looked at something like Hollow Knight, which is by an indie developer, Team Cherry, from Australia. And the music for that is entirely MIDI. So the composer, Christopher Larkin, has his digital library of samples, and he works with that. But like God of War Ragnarok for like Sony, Barry McCreary used like a full orchestra with traditional like Norwegian and Swedish instruments, the whole nine yards. Wow. So it depends on what the aesthetic is and what the game company can actually afford in yeah, terms of aesthetics. Because some of these companies make it uh, sound so full. Like even in listening exactly. to a MIDI track, it sounds like I'm listening to an orchestra, which is exactly. really cool. I don't like, because we're going to play some examples. I'm not sure if they're uh, MIDI produced or if they're actually using symphonies. I guess we can talk about that when we yeah. play them. Yeah, definitely. Um, but before we do get to examples, I, I just want to ask you a couple of questions about the contemporary you yeah. know, music, video game music scene, just because you know, I'm interested. Definitely. I'm wondering about like any you know very hot areas of studies, whether like like and, and also your niche in the field mm -hmm. and uh, anything else you can tell us about where video game music it, is at right now in terms of right. the academia and the study. Definitely. Yeah, well it's kind of one of those things because Ludo Musicology is pretty new. It's still like kind of all over the map. There are still lots of opportunities to come in and like do new research. I mean, even doing things for my thesis, very little has been written on music and landscapes in video games. So I was like reaching out to like I did a lot of research on horror films and horror film music because the visual and musical conventions kind of come from there for like ruins and caves in role playing games or like you're drawing on psychology or like classical studies. Um, so a lot of people take lenses from other disciplines or like Western art music, so like classical music to kind of ground their game music research because game music as a whole doesn't have a ton of methods of analysis on its own. There are a couple, but it tends to be drawn from other kind of disciplines. But yeah, I would imagine psychology is a is a big influencer, of course, because oh, you're sure. appealing to individuals, you know, I'll say uh, emotions or 
the other such thing about the brain. Like you're mm-hmm. trying to yeah. immerse them in this atmosphere. How can we properly immerse them? Exactly. Well, yeah, that's that's exactly what we were talking about in class today is like immersion, interactivity, and this concept called mental models. Like what I was talking to Bastion about before as well with like wanderlust is that like mental models are this um, kind of approach. You approach a game, a new game with preformed expectations based on like your past experiences with other games, with movies, the real world. It's like when you walk into a forest or a field, you have expectations for what that music is going to sound like, right? And if the music doesn't match what you're expecting, it's very jarring. I played like this, I don't know, very modern, like rock kind of influenced piece. And it with a forest or field, you feel this like disjunction and it can pull you out of the game because it's not what you're expecting. Right? right. So yeah, psychology is very important. On, on this track of psychology, like the last question I want to ask before we get to examples, actually was one that uh, Alex had made. So I'd love Alex to ask yeah. this question because it relates so much to this. Hi everyone. Uh, so Dr. Gallagher, my question for you is: I know that music, our video game music, is made uh, with several goals, but one being concentration. So to keep mm-hmm. the player concentrated on the game right. and I'm just wondering what musical theory um, methods or, or techniques are applied to video game music to make that concentration happen mm, that's a good question definitely I think that the like a, yeah a lot of psychologists talk about like attention and involvement as being important for video games as well and I think that interactivity of the music really is important because like that's the one thing that really distinguishes game music from film music is that it responds to your actions. So like when you choose to enter like a battle or something, the music shifts into the battle theme and it like gives you that subtle cue that it's responding to your actions so you feel more like you're invested. It matches like your mood and the state of what you're doing in the gameplay. Even like so nuanced as to if there's like a slight change, like you go to a different part of an area, some games will create different instrumentation of the same track and they'll like take in take instruments out or add different ones in to subtly suggest like a different kind of narrative function to what you're doing. So yeah, so I've done like a little bit of work on that, but I think that's really how it it keeps you involved and keeps your attention as well. Yeah. Yeah, I definitely notice that when I'm gaming, uh, if you go to a different area uh, on whatever map you're playing, uh, the track will change and it'll change to something that might suit that area a bit more and uh, give you a certain feeling like, ooh, this is mysterious or this Definitely. is adventurous. But uh, back to the concentration, mm. uh, for us students, uh, do you think that there's any benefit to listening to video game music or any music uh, with this concentration in mind for when we're studying? Mm, that's a good question. I mean, I don't know. It depends what kind of like <laughs> mood you want to create as well. Um, I- I'm always a big fan of like, I've worked on pastoral music, um, which is the music for that forest and field kind of um, location. So it tends to draw on like conventions from art music too. So it's like woodwinds, it's lots of drones, it's very peaceful. So if you're trying to keep like your concentration and feel like kind of zen and not stressed about stuff, I'd say like pastoral would be a great thing to listen to. Um, Sometimes I have like a pastoral music playlist that I listen to when I'm like trying to get stuff done. But it depends, I think it depends on the game. Like I have different soundtracks myself for like doing scholarly research, like Near Automata works really well for that for some reason for me. But like getting stuff done, something more energetic and like rock and jazz, like Persona 5, you know? So I think it depends like what you're studying for as well and like what kind of mood you want to create to keep that focus. Yeah, that's so interesting. Thank you so much. Yeah, you're welcome. So um, we, were at, we were actually going to play a very like pastoral track today. Right. Unfortunately, we might we might skip over it just to get to like a lot with your other work. That's but, okay. Um, yeah, like we're we're definitely interested in um, like pastoralism as a musical theme. I also you know in doing some more research on your work, I also noticed that you've studied anti-pastoral yes. landscapes. Do you want to tell us like briefly what the what those are yeah. exactly? Oh, definitely. Yeah, anti-pastoral is a little bit more nebulous, I guess. It comes from classical studies research because like in Virgil's Eclogues, which are pastoral poems, um, there there's this intrusion of the city. So Rome, that kind of like it comes in, it kicks the shepherds off their land and into exile. And it creates this, like it disrupts the peacefulness of the, the countryside. Um, so in the same sense, those elements are called anti-pastoral in Virgil's poems. 
And in video games, I argue that anti-pastoral landscapes are those like dark foreboding areas that disrupt the feelings of peacefulness you would find in pastoral locations. Is there anything from like ruins, tombs, caves, enemy military facilities, anything especially with like that industrial kind of vibe? So those enemy military facilities, um, research facilities as well that are like spooky labs. Um, and the music for that relies very heavily on horror um, elements. So yeah, so they're very unsettling areas. So it's essentially the antithesis of what a pastoral music might sound like. Right. Which, yeah, like I, which I've listened to and I think, I think people probably know what we're talking about when we say pastoral. Um, definitely. Actually, I'll, I'll play 30 seconds of this just to okay, get, yeah, really get a feel. So this is, uh, this is Wanderlust by, remind me of the... Uh, Yoko Shimomura. It's from Final Fantasy XV. Okay, so we'll play 30 seconds of this. So that hopefully gives you a sense of what we're talking about when we say pastoral music. Mm -hmm. um, but now I want to play an example uh, from a game that you've looked a, a lot at, I believe. And I don't believe this is pastoral music, <laughs> really, in listening to it. So I, I want to talk about your work in Final Fantasy. Yeah. Um, um, and so there are two different tracks we want to play, which I believe build on each other, if I remember correctly. Exactly, um, yeah. do, do you want to preface these tracks in any way before we play them for the audience? Sure, yeah, it kind of goes off of your previous question about anti-pastoral as well. So like one of the things that I'm really interested in right now is this idea of like a narrative structure called the catapasis, which literally means like a going down. So it's a descent into what is often a metaphorical underworld, um, which is often embodied by these anti-pastoral landscapes. And so I'm looking at the different kinds of conflicts that you find at kind of the height of the catabasis. Um, often it's a, a journey through which a character achieves a sort of metaphorical transformation is what a lot of classical studies uh, scholars talk about. Um, and there are different kind of options. So there's like a character versus a regular enemy, a character versus like a former friend or ally or family member who's maybe been turned against you and a character versus themselves, which is what you find in these tracks. So this is like, it's from a Katabasis in Final Fantasy 16, where the main character, Clive Rosfield, goes on this journey of self-discovery into the Apoditary, which is a place that's very sacred to his ancestors. Um, and he ends up at the bottom, um, coming face to face with this creature uh, called the Infernal Icon, or Ifrit, that he's recently discovered he can transform into. And he's not sure if he's the one who's responsible for the devastation at this uh, castle like several years prior. And he's doubting like his own kind of powers and what that kind of means for him as a, as a person, you know, whether he committed some atrocious kind of things. Um, and through this battle, he ends up facing his own shadow and comes to accept this power, not as like something monstrous, but as a part of himself. And the music kind of witnesses that transformation from moving to something very embattled to something that is very heroic. And it introduces his theme for the first time in connection with him, which is very important, I think. So. The, the, the idea of character themes I want to get into after we, we play this because it's a big part of video game music. So I think uh, we'll, we'll, we'll play the first track for sure. everybody. Um, and so this first track is called um, Press On. Um, so here we, here we go.
So that was an expert for, uh, excerpt from Press On. And um, so I'm curious, like, what exactly is going on in the game when you're hearing this sound? Right, yeah. So this is like, it's the second part of like a three-part battle. The first part has this very conventional music that's like every time you fight like what's called an icon, which is one of these like elemental aligned creatures, it plays. And then Clive thinks he's done when he defeats this infernal icon, Ifrit. And then he suddenly turns around and his shadow is staring back at him and press on starts playing. He, he's, he's visibly shaken. You ha he has his hand trembling on his sword and he's like, okay, like, come on, Clive, face your fears. And then you start the second phase of the battle against your shadow. So it's this kind of rep representation of his self-doubt, you know, that he has burned the castle to the ground, that he did kill his younger brother, Joshua, like 13 years ago, you know? And so it's this kind of like, he's very concerned that, you know, this darkness is like a part of me, right? And it kind of exemplifies that conflict because the melody is trying. It's very much what is in his theme, like find the flame, which I think you'll play in a minute. But the sections are all kind of like, they're in a different order. You have this like solo melody instrument that's really fighting against this really dark accompaniment. So it really exemplifies that personal struggle wow. at this point. So you're saying in the, in the context where this music comes up, it's, it's sh sh giving the, the player a lot in terms of like narrative cues. Exactly. Um, it, it, it's giving it's giving the player something. It's it's evoking something in the player, telling them something about what the developers are trying to exactly you know, show. Like this is the the biggest personal struggle. I mean, Clive does struggle with his powers throughout the game, but this is really the the culmination of that this battle. And after that, he's able to find a new sense of purpose which kind of follows him throughout the game. But up until this point, he's been obsessed with revenge against this person he thinks has killed his brother. And now it looks like that might be him. And he's having trouble reconciling that power and like what he has perhaps done. So that kind of, yeah, it exemplifies that struggle through the music. Right. Yeah, I, I think this touches on, I mean, like, well, like, it, it, it all ends up touching on it, like any aspect that we talk about it, but um, like, and, and like not just metaphor building, like in this example, but the way that, it's not that you just have like a, the video game medium and the music with it, whether it complements it or is implemented. I think all together, there's a little bit of like a more than a sum of its parts sort of thing mm -hmm. that happened as like a greater overall art piece sort of thing. Definitely. Um, I think that's what's really interesting too, because it's also like, yeah, I, I don't want to get too distracted with that, but I, I just want to say like, just it's, it's it, examples like this are really good examples of like the, it's not just mixing of mediums. It's, it's a, whole new generated mm -hmm. medium of art. And I it's cool because I think that generalizes to all art. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sorry. I just Definitely. Don't Definitely. be sorry, that's an amazing observation. Um, yeah, no, I, I would totally agree. Like it, it, taking it full, the full picture uh, with the music and the game, it's like this immersive experience completely. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Um, I don't play a lot of video games, admittedly, but when I have, I've really noticed the music and it has Definitely. done a lot to put me in the world. Like I played, you know, uh, Star Wars in 20, the 2015 Star so cool. Wars game. And hearing that Star Wars music was yeah. like, wow, I am controlling Luke right now, fighting in the This dark. is awesome, right? Yeah, this is, <laughs> exactly. This is awesome. Like the it music empowers does, you. Yeah. The music does so much. And, Absolutely. Um, and so just to clarify with this, is this, if you know, uh, was this recorded live or like a live studio, a live band, or was this MIDI? Was this all MIDI? I think it was live, but I need to check like the CD liner notes for that. But I'm pretty sure it's a live orchestra for this. Right. Yeah. I suppose it could be both. There could it be could MIDI be. elements and recorded. Yeah, we've seen a lot of elements in class too where it, it mixes, especially like for electronically processed kind of sounds. Like it can be both for sure. Right. But yeah. Yeah, definitely. Wonderful. Okay, well, there's a final example that we want to get to. But so just to preface for our audience who hasn't played Final Fantasy, can you tell us about what happens from like when, when the, the player would hear press on to when they would hear this song coming up. Mm -hmm, definitely, yeah, it's like, it's talked about very frequently online. It's one of the most climactic moments in the game, I think. Um, at the end of the second phase of the battle, the shadow gets the upper hand and forces Clive back. And he realizes, he says, okay, no escape. I'm done running from you. It's time to find out who we are like once and for all. And that your meter for your limit break gauge, which is like a special attack, fills. And this um, kind of indication comes on screen. It says, press these two buttons to accept the truth. 
and the music cuts out, you just hear this kind of heartbeat. And as soon as you press those two buttons, this track, Find the Flame, comes surging forth. Clive somewhat is called semi-priming, so he's kind of overtaken by some flames and kind of magma, so he embodies that fire power. Um, and then he's ready to face the shadow like on its own terms because it's also done the same in the previous phase. So he accepts his powers as this um, dominant, as it's called, someone who can transform into Ifrit. And he's ready to fight his fears like head on and kind of come to terms with the fact that he has this power and that's not a bad thing. You know? Right. So, so when the player gets to that point, then the music automatically turns to find the flame? It, it just starts, yeah. Just so there's starts. nothing, then there's wow. the heartbeat. And as soon as you press the buttons, it's like it whooshes forth. And the opening of Find the Flame is very interesting as well because, like I said, it rearranges the sections of Press On because the first section is now like Clive's theme or leitmotif. She was like, da dum pa dum pa da da dum. And that is the theme that follows him for the rest of the game. Wow. And that is the first time you hear it in connection with him specifically here. Right here, um, so, okay. But that will so continue on after this. Many, many times. Many there times. are like eight or ten different iterations of it that play over like cinematic scenes, largely when he's talking about building a new world, which is like his new sense of purpose. So this is the moment that he gets past that will for revenge and kind of looks to the future and comes to term with, terms with his past. Wow. So the music becomes much more heroic here, but it's like still a dark kind of heroism because um, he does have this like unfortunate tragic past but still it, it's still much more heroic would you mind singing that character motif melody one more time so I'll that our, our listeners can <laughs> yeah. identify it it's like da dum ba dum ba da da dum all right everyone so listen out for that when we play find the flame from final fantasy
And that was Find the Flame um, from Final Fantasy. And so there was, a, there was a lot there that we can talk about. For sure. Um, but I do want to hone in on that idea of that melody that is used to symbolize the main character's sort of theme, mm -hmm. calling. Uh, I can't sing it like from That's by okay. heart, but <laughs> I'd good. love you to talk about the idea of character motifs in video game music because that seems like a really important concept. Oh, for sure. Yeah, that's something we'll be talking about in like a couple weeks after reading week in the class too, is like this idea of light motifs, which comes very much from like 19th century Wagnerian opera. Wow, um, okay. Yeah, so this idea, like, Wagner had light motifs for everything, like, hundreds of light motifs for one opera, like, a fire motif and so and so's character motif. And so that kind of carries over into video game music by way of films. Um, so you do have things like, it depends on the game, not every game uses them. Final Fantasy VII has a lot of them as well for the different characters. Um, but, like, even in 16, there are ones for pretty much every, like, protagonist and antagonist like Clive has one his brother Joshua has one his love interest Jill has one um, and they kind of get transformed over the course of the game and there are also these like light motifs that are associated with larger entities as well so like the holy empire of San Breck has a light motif that is used when you see like scenes that are set there or people are talking who are from that like empire or even locations that are associated with it like the glass mines, you hear bits and pieces of that light motif in there. So that kind of tells you exactly where you are in the game world. Or in the sense of characters, seems like what is happening with that character, right? Because we see like these different settings of the same character's theme. And it tells you like exactly what has happened to them, right? If there's like a transformation or something. No, it's, it's extremely effective storytelling. Uh, and it it's is. funny that you mentioned light motifs in the context of opera, because uh, mm -hmm. we so we have a theory a session every Wednesday in our club, yeah. and we were talking about musicals, and uh, in musicals, uh, of course, stemming from opera, uh, everywhere there's these motifs for people. Um, and so we were we were listening to even like uh, like Frozen as like a movie right. uh, has motifs for the the main characters and everything like this, definitely. and then the like, evil characters have their own motifs. Exactly. And. For video game music, it's really compelling because you're oftentimes controlling the character as well. Exactly. And so you almost, you as a character, you as a character immersing yourself in that character you're controlling, mm -hmm. you almost think of it as your motif, which I find exactly. really, really cool as well. I definitely oh, felt sure. that playing as Luke uh, in like the Star yeah. Wars. I, I felt like <laughs> exactly. I was Luke in that way because he had his own, you know, uh, music. So Absolutely. Yeah. Well, yeah, it's often how we talk about games too. Like I, I people in my research study as well when I was doing my PhD research like and myself we don't talk about it in the third person often like you know like Final Fantasy 16 Clive did this I said I did this right <laughs> like yeah. I went here and I defeated my shadow or something right so that that very much is the case you associate yourself with your player character and that kind of enhances the immersion as well right so definitely right I wonder like how music can be used to um let's say um set the mood on how one's feeling about their own character. So mm -hmm. if you hear the dark motif on your character, then you're feeling like, you know, I'm in trouble or something. Whereas mm -hmm. if you hear the lighter, more pastoral, then you get the sense that my character is, you know, maybe, you know, safe or right. something like this. So yeah, well, there's a really, interesting. like, interesting example as well. It depends, like, near is really bad for this. Um, the, I, I work on like the near series as well, and like anti-ludic music, which is not meant to make you feel good. Um, so there, there is like the final boss battle of near replicant where you are fighting the shadow Lord who like spoilers turns out that it's your, your soul and you are his body and you've been like split in two, but near the main character hates the shadow Lord cause he kidnapped his sister. It turns out, of course, is the Shadow Lord's sister as well, right? Um, and as you finish the fight, instead of becoming more triumphant, the theme for the Shadow Lord, which is also kind of your theme um, because you're the same person, it strips back from this big orchestral like choir texture eventually to this music box as you do like the final blow and it's just, and it ends mid-phrase. And you have this, this sense of incompleteness and it's meant to make you feel really horrible about what you've done. And then, of course, because of the structure of the game, you have to go back and do that three more times to get to the eventual, like, ending E of the game. So you know what you're doing. You have this very, like, unsatisfying musical conclusion that is, like, effectively your theme being stripped back to nothing, you know, and it, it makes you feel horrible about what you're doing. But it's very intentional that way. And it only builds back up again in that last ending E when Nier is restored to humanity, like, to his full self. 
So, yeah. Yeah, like just back to metaphor building, like well, if, if you parallel the structures of the music with the structures of the game, Mm-hmm. It, like they, they, they I, I think there's there's a really interesting thing that happens there. Mm-hmm. Uh, another example, like this is probably what I'm gonna do, like do the project on because yeah. I'm I'm also in the class, uh, is on Undertale and they, I think there's a lot of really neat theory or like metaphor building there and especially because mm-hmm. it like really takes it to another level where there's like this meta narrative right. and like fourth wall breaking sort of thing mm-hmm. that happens. So like the like the the the, the 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 different structures within the music and the game like all parallel like the like I guess the purpose or like the message of the game or like even just like the playing of the game goes like really really I th- I, th- I think th- there's something really cool about the whole fourth wall breaking thing that's like super Absolutely. novel I mean I, like maybe there are other games that have done this or, or like it, there's like I'm talking about like an equivalent thing in something else but I think there's something really no- interesting that's not like novel there. That's true. Yeah, especially like because Flowey like deletes your save file right at the yeah, end, and right? The and he's like, like, "Oh, too bad for you, you, right?" <laughs> yeah. Yeah it's, it's, yeah, it's cool. Yeah, it's very unsettling, right? <laughs> well, I I will say, um, we well, unfortunately we only have two minutes left to talk, so I want to briefly mention yeah. uh, a very exciting event that's coming up related to your field, mm-hmm. uh, which is the North American Conference on Video Game Music. Yeah. So, do you want to just briefly tell us about what's going on uh, with this conference? Oh, for sure. Yeah, it's a traveling conference. So it's in its 11th year. This year it's at the University of Michigan, um, but it's also because of like COVID, they've gone to hybrid format. Um, so it's fully online as well. So they actually like stream um, from the actual conference room. So if you attend on Zoom, you can actually like see the presentations, the presenters, you can ask them questions. Last year, there was like a lively chat in the Zoom happening like during and after presentations where people were coming up with like extra examples based on what was being talked about. Um, So it's like, even if you want to go online, it's like being in person. Like they have a Zoom lobby where you can connect with other attendees. It's everything from like case studies of individual games to like broad kind of studies of the nature of video game music and like theory um, to particular genres, um, even to like sound effects in games and how that contributes to our experience. Or like even music outside of games, like there were some papers last year about the implementation of music in cues at Disney and how that helps kind of set the mood for getting on certain rides and stuff like that. So it's like a packed two days full of various facets of game music. And the best part is it's also free for undergrads. Wow. So oh, for undergrads, oh, cool. For undergrads, yeah. Not for grads, but for Not for grads, yeah. It's like $20 if you're like a graduate student or a community member, Wow. but free for undergrads. So. I, I think it says a lot about the feel that they have that social infrastructure of this whole yeah. conference uh, for all academics and just people involved in the field. Like you Absolutely. might not have had that 10 years ago. I'm not... I'm That's sure. true. Yeah, it was very much piecemeal, right? Like just bits and pieces. But I think like this, the North American Conference on Video Game Music and like there's a Society for the Study of Sound and Music in Video Games, the SSSMG. Um, and they're also very good at like they publish the Journal of Sound and Music in Games. And that's that's very recent, but that's another great community as well for wow. people who are interested. Wow. Well, yeah, this is amazing. All this is amazing information. Um, thank you so much for coming on, Professor. Unfortunately, we only have 40 seconds left, but it's been amazing to talk to you. Um, you. I, if your course is ever offered again, uh, then I really encourage students to go out and look for it. I'm not sure. sure if it's going to be like every year or something like that. I or hope so. You don't, uh, hope we're, so. We're just trialing it this year under special topics. I spoke with the chair um, back in the summer about that, and we'll see if it's offered in the future. I'm very much hoping so, but yeah, I'll right. keep you posted. Well, Definitely. thanks again for coming in. Thank uh, you very so much. quick, very quick shout outs to Caleb Koo, who's playing the jazz room this Friday. Um, he's going to be great. Uh, we were going to play his music, but we have a very important <laughs> topic today. Uh, so, anyway, thank you for everyone in bandwidth. We love you, listening party. We love you, Lee Gregory. Hi, this is Caleb Koo. You're listening to CKMS 1027 FM Radio Waterloo. Hi, I'm Val, your host of the Eclectic Garage right here on 102.7 CKMS. Do you want to host your own show like me? Or are you looking for a unique...
an interesting gift idea. Well, here's your opportunity. For just $25 a year, you get a membership to Radio Waterloo and a half-hour show where you or your gift recipient are the host. Even if you just want to donate, you're helping support community radio. Visit RadioWaterloo.ca for more details. In the tradition of winter storytelling, you are invited to a celebration of Indigenous film. Come to the Princess Twin Cinemas in Waterloo to see Run Woman Run on February 5th, Beans on February 12th, and Bones of Crows on February 28th. Sponsored by the CFUW-KW in response to the calls for action of the National Truth and Reconciliation Commission, this film series is free. Join us for the films and for follow-up discussion with Indigenous representatives from the University of Waterloo. Visit the Princess Cinema website at princesscinemas.com for showtime.